Good afternoon, everybody, to uh, today's seminar, which is about using Earth system science at ECMWF. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. So why do we want to use Earth system science at ECMWF? Well, as you know, our primary goal is to forecast the weather in the atmosphere on the medium range timescale. But to do that, to improve the quality of the weather forecasts and also associated activities around it, we have to consider larger and larger parts of the Earth system. And in this cartoon, which you have here on the slide, you see that it's the land surface, it's the ocean, and it's also the composition of the atmosphere that matters. It's not just the atmosphere itself. And this is what we're working towards, including gradually more and more of these components into our forecasting system. But if we go back in history to the very beginning of numerical weather prediction, in the mid-1950s, the first successful NWP forecasts came out. But at that time, the atmosphere was represented just by a single level and regional model. But doing this, it was actually possible to make decent forecasts up to about two days ahead. They were decent in the sense that they were better than the alternatives, the purely manually produced synoptic forecasts. Now, as the computer power increased and as the science progressed, the models developed into multiple level models in the 1960s. And in the 1970s, clouds and radiation were included, first in a very primitive way, if I remember correctly, the first representation of clouds was just to have a climatology of clouds included in the model, but gradually the clouds became interactive with the flow and with the radiation. And then in the 1980s, the regional domain was extended to the whole globe. It was realized that to make forecasts more than just a couple of days ahead, you really needed to consider the whole global system in order to be able to improve the forecast quality. But the models were still concentrating on the atmosphere. It was just the atmospheric component in the forecasting systems. Then ECMWF came, and the operational forecast had started in 1979. And of course, the components that were developed in ECMWF was first of all the data assimilation, an improved use of all the observations, the ensemble technique for also determining the uncertainty of the forecast, and then a further component, namely the ocean waves, which was also pioneered at ECMWF. But now we are moving into a domain where we cannot just look at the ocean waves and the atmosphere. We have to consider all the parts around it as well. And the Earth system science components that we are working on here at ECMWF is first of all the atmospheric composition. The constituents in the atmosphere, not just the air molecules, but the aerosols and the different gases, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, lots of these gases which are in the atmosphere, which are important in their own right because they affect pollution and things like that, but they're actually also needed to enhance the capability to forecast the weather. And I'll show you some examples of that. So now we both have chemical data assimilation and chemical prediction in our modeling system. And it will have an impact on NWP. Then we have the marine part of the system. I mentioned ocean wave forecasts, but we are also working with the complete ocean model, not just the surface, but the whole ocean. And we also do data assimilation in the oceans. We use observations from the ocean to ingest in our forecasting system. We have this coupled ocean atmosphere prediction model, including, of course, the interface with the waves and also the sea ice in the future. And this ocean wave forecasting capability is actually something where we are quite advanced. We have been doing this for many years. And then the third area that I want to talk about is climate monitoring. Our main objective is to do weather forecasts in the medium range, a time scale three to 10 days ahead. But we have also, for quite a number of years, been doing so-called reanalysis. That is, that we are using an up-to-date modern data assimilation and forecasting system and then ingesting observations from the historical past into this modern data assimilation system to get both a space and time homogeneous description of the evolution of the state of the atmosphere, as well as the other Earth system components. And I will end my talk by describing what we're doing in atmospheric reanalysis, in ocean reanalysis, and also in coupled ocean atmosphere reanalysis, which is really a topic for the future. 
But let me start by talking about the atmospheric composition and monitoring. At ECMWF, we have been running a project which is called MAC, which deals with this, to combine the weather forecasting that you see up here with forecasting of constituents in the atmosphere, which comes from environmental monitoring, like pollution, but also constituents up in the higher parts of the atmosphere. And this is merged on a global scale with the atmospheric prediction model, and then from these global scale forecasts, we also feed regional forecast models in exactly the same way as is done for weather prediction to have more detailed forecasts of regional aspects of atmospheric composition. Uh, the, pres the present project is called MAC, but this will develop into something new called Copernicus Services run by the European Union, where we hope to take part and deliver these Copernicus services to society in general, which will include also atmospheric composition. Just as an example to show you one particular atmospheric constituent and how it's in inserted into our forecasting system, I'll choose carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide is a gas in the atmosphere with fairly low concentrations, but still of importance. And to observe the concentrations of carbon monoxide, you can both use satellite information and you can use in situ observations. For atmospheric composition, of course, you also need to know what is injected into the atmosphere. And the injections come both from human activities, the anthropogenic sources of atmospheric composition, so we need a mapping of that. We need information about the emissions worldwide. So that is one aspect fed into our system. There are also natural systems who emit carbon monoxide into the atmosphere, for instance, forest fires. So we also have a system both for registering the forest fires from satellite observations, and then a model which tells us, given the distribution of the forest fires, how much carbon monoxide is emitted into the atmosphere. So all this goes in to a global modeling system, and then that global modeling system is used for forecasts a few days and even up to 10 days ahead. And from the global forecast system, you can then also have boundary conditions for regional models on the European scale and where you can do air quality forecasts. So one particularly exciting example actually happened at exactly the time of the council meeting almost a month ago. It was an episode in Central Europe where we had very hot conditions and also stable conditions without too much wind. And what this movie here shows you is the time evolution of the ozone concentration over Europe for the time span Monday the 17th of June until Thursday the 20th of June. The map in the upper left hand corner is the concentration on Wednesday the 19th of June at 12 UTC. And the levels that we see here are actually close to being dangerous. If the color is up towards the dark red black scale, then the concentrations of ozone are dangerous to human beings. So in this particular case, the forecast showed that in particular over northwestern Europe, and in particular over Netherlands, if you see in this picture, there was a risk of having very high concentrations of ozone. This happened to occur exactly at the time of the council meeting, and if I would have been giving this lecture to the council, I wouldn't have known what the answer was. I wouldn't have been sure that this actually occurred. But talking now, some weeks later, I can of course check what actually happened. Did this occur in reality? And looking at observations in De Bilt in Holland, these curves here show you both the forecast of the temperature in red and the forecast of the ozone concentration in blue together with the measurements given as crosses for this time period, 17th to the 20th. And what you see is that there were these temperature peaks in the middle of the day, corresponding to the diurnal cycle. And for the 18th, there was an associated peak also in the ozone, which occurred both in the forecasts and in the observations. But looking at the 19th of June, the observed concentrations and the observed temperature were much lower than forecasted. And this was due to the fact that severe thunderstorms developed over Holland. And this was actually not predicted by our meteorological forecasting system. 
So I think this very nicely shows the close link between the weather forecast and the atmospheric composition forecast. It is not enough to know just where the sources are and to have accurate initial conditions. You must also know how the weather develops. And if you don't have the right weather forecast, you won't get the correct, correct forecast of atmospheric composition. So it really shows the virtue of having these systems coupled into one prediction system. Now another aspect of the atmospheric composition work we're doing is the planning of future satellite missions. In the future, there will be many new satellites who will also have the capability to monitor chemical composition of the atmosphere. And these are some examples of planned satellite missions and where the MAC project is taking an active part in the design and also execution of these satellite projects. We're also involved in algorithm development, that is to develop the software that's needed to use all the observations that will be coming in from these future satellites. So that's also an important part, and especially in the Copernicus project, which will be very much about satellites and remote sensing. This comes in as a very important feature. Then, of course, one question is, does the chemistry also affect the weather? Is it important for weather forecasts to know what the composition of the atmosphere is? Well, of course, for climate, we know that the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere matters for the surface temperature of the Earth. But how about the other constituents of the atmosphere? Well, if we take aerosols, small particles in the atmosphere, that is actually quite important for determining the radiation balance. In particular, the reflection of the solar light that is affected by aerosols. And by including the aerosol effects in our global forecasting system, we have also been able to demonstrate that there is actually a considerable impact of the distribution of aerosols on the low level flow, and in particular, in tropical regions. And what this map here shows you is for the month of July 2011, seen as an average over the whole month, the influence of having an improved description of aerosols in a weather forecasting system. So the colors here show you the difference in the low level wind, the 10 meter wind, between if you use the climatology for aerosols produced in the MAC project, or the reference, the operational climatology of the aerosols that we are actually using today in our operational forecasting system. And if you look at the differences, and if you concentrate on the region around the Somali jet, between the African Horn and India, you see blue and red colors indicating wind differences on the order of five meters per second. These are substantial differences. And if you look at the real position of this Somali jet, including the aerosols, actually improve the positioning of the Somali jet. So in terms of the climatology of our forecasting system, having the correct distribution of aerosols, and in particular seasonal variations, has demonstrably given a positive effect on the meteorological forecasting system. This is not the only example. There are other examples of this. For instance, carbon dioxide and how carbon dioxide affects radiative transfer and how carbon dioxide concentrations are important for the assimilation of radiative information that gives us temperature and humidity distributions. So I think there are a number of areas where we will see more and more how a better description of the composition of the atmosphere will also improve the standard meteorological forecasts. So this is an area where the Earth system modeling concept is important for the future development of our weather forecasting system. Moving on to marine, marine monitoring and forecasting. Our goal, central goal, is to improve the medium range weather forecasts. But for about two decades, we have also been doing forecasts on the extended range timescales, the monthly and the seasonal timescales. And of course, when you do forecasts on these very long timescales, it is self-evident that you cannot only consider the atmosphere. You must also include the oceans, because the oceans are the memory of the system. The oceans are much more sluggish. They take longer time to change, and therefore they affect the evolution of the weather on longer timescales. So for a extended range seasonal forecasting system, we need a coupled ocean atmosphere model. 
which means that to determine the initial state of the system, it is not enough just to know the current state of the atmosphere. We must also know the current state of the oceans. So in addition to the atmospheric observations, we also have to include oceanic observations. We feed this in to an assimilation system where we also generate initial states for an ensemble, where we perturb the initial conditions for the forecasting system to also give us an uncertainty estimate. And this is particularly important for extended range forecasts. And then the output of the forecasting system gives us maps and plots of parameters which tell us something about what will happen on the seasonal time range. The seasonal forecasting system that has been developed here at ECMWF has undergone generation changes. Right now we have something called System 4, which means that it's the fourth generation of the seasonal forecasting system. And we have demonstrated considerable capability in doing seasonal forecasts for the tropical regions, in particular El Nino, La Nina conditions. There we have skill in our forecasting system. For mid-latitudes, it is more difficult to demonstrate skill in a seasonal forecasting system. But it's very clear that in order to develop this into the future, to improve the seasonal forecasting capabilities, we have to improve a coupled ocean atmosphere system. The ocean is of major importance for these long time scales. So I just thought I wanted to show you a little bit about the ocean observations, because of course one big difference between the oceans and the atmosphere is the availability of observations. And in the oceans, over the past 10, 15 years, an observing system called the Argo floats has successively been installed. And I think there are a couple of thousands of these Argo floats nowadays in the oceans. And in the map here in the middle, you see the present coverage of the Argo floats. This is corresponding to radio sounds in the atmosphere, weather balloons but they go down instead of up. And they actually go both down and up like a jojo to measure the state of the ocean. In addition to this, you have more moored ocean observing systems. You have uh, XPTs, expendable bathythermographs, which are thrown out from ships. And of course, you also have satellite information about the ocean. Not about the inner parts of the ocean, but about the upper surface of the ocean giving you both information about ocean color, but also about the state, the wave state of the ocean, which is so important for our wave forecasts. So the system that we are developing, the coupled ocean atmosphere model, has a number of components. It has the IFS, the atmospheric model, that we use for medium range prediction. It has a wave model for the surface waves of the ocean, and an ocean model which has not been developed here, but developed by a consortium in Europe, and it's called the NEMO. And we are also in the process of developing a model for sea ice to be included in the forecasting system. And with the arrows here, you see the various couplings between the ocean and the atmosphere. And these couplings are under development. Effort is put into describing more and more accurately how the state of the atmosphere and the ocean and the intermediate interface have to be described in order to give the best possible physical state description of the system. And it involves heat fluxes, it involves precipitation fluxes, it involves momentum fluxes for wind, and of course in northern and also Arctic and Antarctic regions, the sea ice is of vital importance. And that's actually where we have one of the main weaknesses of our system at the moment in the description of the sea ice. And we're working on that to improve the sea ice description and to include it in future forecasting systems. Now, I told you that the seasonal forecast system has been under development for some time, and it includes a coupled ocean atmosphere model. This coupling has only been taken into account for the extended range time scale. Up to 10 days of forecast time, we have up to now only been using an atmospheric model with prescribed sea surface temperatures. But recent experimentation has actually shown that it is advantageous to couple the atmosphere with the ocean already from the initial time. Even in the medium range, the main goal for our forecasting system, a coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean appears to be important. And just to show you a plot to demonstrate that this has been verified with numerical experimentation, 
This is showing you in terms of the winds at 200 hectopascal in the tropics, the improvement that you get from coupling ocean and atmosphere from day zero compared to only having an atmospheric model. So this is in terms of probabilistic forecast scores coupled to the ensemble system. And you see that at day zero, the effect is very small, but then it picks up very quickly. Already after day three, four, you see a clear positive impact of coupling the ocean to the atmosphere. And it's in particular in the tropical areas where we see this positive impact. So the system requires the wind changes in the atmosphere to influence the ocean, which then changes, in particular, the temperatures of the ocean surface, which have the feedback on the atmosphere. And this coupling is important to have from the very beginning, and it doesn't just influence the phenomena close to the surface of the atmosphere. It also influences the wind at 200 hectopascal, at something like 10 kilometers height. So, so this coupling is really vital also for our medium range forecasting capabilities. And these are fairly new results, but they will be, this coupling will be included in the operational forecast system in the next cycle for the ensemble prediction system. Finally, about reanalyses. As I said at the beginning, the reanalysis concept is to use a modern data assimilation system to take observations from the past and assimilate them in a homogeneous way in time and space. Reanalysis production at ECMWF has actually been going on for the entire history of ECMWF. This here shows you a timeline of reanalysis starting already in 1979 with the so-called Figgy year, the first GARP global experiment. This was a very concentrated period, I think it was only a year, with an increase in the number of observations to assess the importance of having more observations for numerical weather prediction. And the European Center was a pioneer in assimilating all this extra observational information and showing the potential impact. This then continued with the first reanalysis project, the so-called ERA-15, which took a 15-year period and used the most up-to-date assimilation system available together with observations over a 15-year period to produce a comprehensive data set. And this was done in the mid-1990s. Around the year 2000, a new reanalysis was produced. This was called the ERA-40. This was a 40-year data set spanning all the way from the end of the 1950s up until the present day. And this data set has really been very much used by, in particular, the research community. And then, the most recent version of the reanalysis is called the ERA Interim. It spans the period from 1979 up and until present day, uses a version of the forecasted system, which is a couple of years old now. It's, it's more than five years old, actually. But it is the most up-to-date reanalysis we have at the moment. And this reanalysis of the atmosphere is both important to have as a description of the state of the atmosphere and how it evolves, but also to improve our forecasts. Because as we develop the forecast system, we need a baseline against which we can intercompare the forecast improvements. And the reanalysis has turned out to be a very stable baseline at which we can really assess our improvements in the forecast system. But it also provides a service to society. Reanalyses are extensively used in research as atmospheric data sets but also for commercial applications, like, for instance, wind energy. They use reanalysis to cite new wind energy farms to get an estimate of the wind climatology in a certain place over a longer time span. So reanalysis has developed into a very important base activity here at ECMWF. Now, in addition to the reanalysis of the atmosphere, also reanalyses of the oceans have been done. And this started in the 1990s with the production of the first reanalysis data set for the ocean called the Aura S3, which was done in 2006. And this was vital also for the seasonal forecasts, because in the seasonal forecast system, you have fairly large biases developing over a time span of seasons. Having a basic data set for the ocean allows you 
to also calibrate these biases in the forecasting system, which is important when you want to use the output. And then with the latest ERA interim, a new ocean reanalysis was produced a couple of years ago, the so-called ORA S4, the reanalysis corresponding to the seasonal forecast system number four. In addition, in 2012, we also produced a reanalysis for the land surface. We have a model for the land surface, which was forced by data from the atmospheric reanalysis, the area interim. And I will show you some quite exciting results from that, where you can actually diagnose properties that you wouldn't find otherwise in a reanalysis and atmospheric uh, prediction system. And then finally, we also have reanalysis of the atmospheric composition. First, the GEMS reanalysis, and more recently, the MAC reanalysis of components like aerosols and different reactive gases. So we actually have quite a comprehensive set of reanalysis available, and which are developing all the time. Because the whole idea with reanalysis is to produce a data set using a recent version of the assimilation system. It means that even if you have reanalyzed a set of historic data once, you have to do it over and over again as you develop the quality of the assimilation and the forecasting system. So one very important aspect of reanalysis, especially if you can do it over longer time periods, is to assess the state of the Earth's climate, monitoring the climate. And the reanalysis is being more and more used in reports showing recent climate change. And this picture here just shows you an example from the Bulletin of the American Met Society. Various aspects of the atmosphere like stratospheric temperature, lower tropospheric temperature, surface temperature, precipitation, total column water vapor, cloudiness, taken from the reanalysis and compared against the baseline to see the evolution of the trends over the recent time period to assess climate change. And the virtue of reanalysis is that you really get this three-dimensional picture of the atmosphere. It's not just the surface climate. You see the whole thing and how it's developing in time. Now, the reanalysis that we have been doing so far have been over what you could call the modern time period, the last 30 to 50 years. That's where we have aimed at with our data. And the purpose is to use to provide the best estimate at any given time to use as many observations as possible, and in recent years, quite a lot from satellites. It's closely tied to the forecast system development, and it's also produced in near real time, which means that it's constantly updated, and people can use it to really see what's happened even over the past half year or so with the climate. But if you look at the evolution of the observing system in the atmosphere, which is what the lower graph here shows you, Actually, going all the way back to the 1800s, you do have surface observations. And as you move forward in time, you get more and more surface observations. And somewhere towards the end of the 1930s, you start also getting observations in the free atmosphere, upper air observations, mainly from weather balloons. And then towards the 1960s, 1970s, you also start to get satellite information. And around 1979, there is a massive increase of satellite information, and it continues to increase. Now note here that the scale on this graph here is logarithmic. So today, the satellites totally dominate the observations we have. We have millions of satellite data coming in every day. Uh, but still, the upper air and the surface information is important as an anchor to the system, to have the in situ observations complemented with satellite information. Now, I said that the most recent reanalysis starts in 1979, and that's because that's when we started to get a lot of satellite data. But of course, it should be possible to go all the way back here to 1900 and to use the data available with the modern assimilation system and also produce a climate reanalysis. And that is actually work which is underway right now to produce a reanalysis over the past 100 plus years. And we need this long perspective to assess climate change. It's really not enough just to look at the last 30 or 40 years. And we can go as far back as we have observations to constrain the system. But of course, when you do this very long-term reanalysis, your focus is on variability and trends. And 
you use only a restricted set of observations to focus on these aspects of, of reanalysis. Now this work has started and it will continue in the next phase of reanalysis, which is called ERA-CLIM-2. It's a project that will start next year in 2014. And this reanalysis will produce a consistent 20th century reanalysis of the whole Earth system, atmosphere, land surface, ocean, sea ice, and the carbon cycle. The goal here in the next phase of reanalysis is to produce a truly coupled atmosphere-ocean reanalysis of the whole Earth system. And this is called CIRA, Coupled Earth Atmosphere Reanalysis. We will also produce a new reanalysis of the satellite instrumental period from 1979 and onwards, using a more up-to-date assimilation system. And I thought I wanted to show you just a couple of examples from these reanalysis efforts that we are pursuing at the moment. To do a reanalysis of the whole 20th century, of course, you have to do this in stages. First of all, you have to make sure that the modeling system you have is reacting correctly to changes in atmospheric composition, changes in carbon dioxide, changes in aerosols, and also to changes in solar radiation, which have occurred over, over this time span. So the first thing that was done was to make a model integration without using observations but to include changes due to changes in the composition of the atmosphere and also with imposed sea surface temperature because it's still only an atmospheric reanalysis. And this graph here shows you both the results from this free model run in terms of temperatures at the Earth's surface for the whole 20th century and compared to one of the standard data sets which is used to evaluate climate change at the surface named the University of East Anglia Hadley Center data set, the so-called CREW-TEM4. The bars here show you the CREW-TEM4 temperature anomalies, and the colors show you the ones corresponding to the free-running reanalysis data system. Also indicated are major volcanic eruptions, Agung, El Chichon, and Pinatubo, which produce a lot of atmospheres, which are also included in this model system. And we see clearly that in connection with the volcanic eruptions, we have a drop in temperatures, both from the Hadley Center University of East Anglia data set and in the free-running reanalysis. Another very prominent feature is, of course, the increase in surface temperatures, in particular over the past few decades, the so-called global warming. And we see that very clearly in, in both data sets. So this gives us confidence that we have a model system which is fit for purpose to include observations from the whole 20th century. But this model is not just at the surface. It extends through the whole atmosphere. So we can also look at temperature trends in the middle atmosphere, around 500 hectopascal, and also in the upper atmosphere, in the stratosphere. And these three graphs shows you, for the whole 20th century, in red and black, the results from the free-running model of this first reanalysis attempt, and overlaid in blue, also temperature trends from the air interim, which is the most recent full system reanalysis, including the observations. And first, first of all, you see that there is a pretty good correspondence between these two. In particular, down at the surface, which is perhaps not surprising because you're prescribing the sea surface temperatures and that's after all about 70% of the Earth's surface, but also at upper levels and even up in the stratosphere. Although some temperature extremes here are more extreme in the air interim than in the free-running model, constrained by observations. Of course, you need the observations as well. You see the clear warming trend at the surface, also a warming trend in the middle of the atmosphere, but then a cooling trend up in the stratosphere, interrupted by events which can be coupled to the volcanic eruptions. If you look carefully here down at the surface, you also see that in the past 10, 15 years or so, the warming trend is not so marked. There seems to be almost a plateau. Temperatures are sort of leveling off in the past one to two decades. 
Of course, one should be very careful at looking at a short time period like this. When you're talking about climate change, you should consider longer time periods. But given the fact that we have a still increasing carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere, it is a little bit surprising that the temperatures at the surface have started to level off like this over the past few decades. Now this is for the atmosphere. How about the oceans? Because after all, the oceans, if you look at the global warming, most of the excess heating goes into the oceans. And that's where the ocean reanalysis comes in as a very handy piece of data to use to understand not just the energy balance of the atmosphere, but the energy balance of the Earth system, including the oceans. Now for the oceans, even though most of the energy goes into the oceans, the temperature changes are very, very, very small because of the large heat capacity of water. So instead of talking about temperature, we talk about heat content in the ocean. And this graph here shows you from our most recent ocean reanalysis, the Aura S4, coupled to this fourth generation seasonal forecasting system, the evolution of heat content in 10 to the 22 joules from 1960 and up and until 2009. The curves here show you the heat content at different depths. The black curve is for the upper 300 meters of the ocean. The blue curve is for the upper 700 meters. And the purple curve is for the total depth of the ocean. Now the curves here also include a estimate of the uncertainty. For instance, the purple curve in the beginning of the period, you see that there is a lot, rather a big uncertainty, which is coupled to the lack of observations over this first time of the, of the um, analysis period. It's only towards the end of this analysis period that we have a lot of ocean observations, for instance, from the Argo system. So looking at the evolution of the heat content, in the beginning of the period, it was going down and then up a bit. Then we have a clear dip here, which is directly connect connected to a volcanic eruption, once again, the El Chichon. We have another dip connected to the Pinatubo eruption. And then we also observe a dip here in the ocean heat content connected to the 1997-1998 El Nino event. Now the El Nino event is in the atmosphere, in the equatorial regions, a warming. But that heat has to come from somewhere, and it comes from the ocean. So if you have a warming of the atmosphere, you have a cooling of the ocean. So in connection with the El Nino, the heat content is going down in the ocean. But after the El Nino, the heat content went up again. The ocean is recharging. And if you look at the past 10 years, there's actually quite a dramatic increase in the heat content of the ocean. In particular, the heat content for the total depth column of the ocean. It's not so marked at the surface, the black curve, but if you look at the upper 700 meters or the total depth, it is quite a dramatic increase of the heat content of the ocean compared to earlier years. Why is that? Well, if you remember, I showed you the plateau in the heating of the atmosphere. One possibility could be that the heat has gone down into the oceans instead of heating the surface and the atmosphere. And if you look at the energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere, an estimate of the energy imbalance, it's on the order of a watt per square meter or slightly less. And the corresponding heating rates that you would expect from such an energy imbalance actually agree quite well with the increase of the ocean heat content that you see in the oceans. So this was published just a couple of months ago in Journal of Geophysical Research and gives a possible an explanation for this plateau in the surface temperatures of the atmosphere. But to understand that, to understand how the atmosphere behaves, you really have to look at the whole system. It's not enough just to look at one part of it. It has to be an Earth system model, a coupled ocean atmosphere reanalysis to really understand the processes behind climate change. And that's one area where we will put increased efforts in the future to really have a coupled system to do reanalysis, both for the purpose of calibrating and verifying our own forecasting system and for supplying to society a good quality data set that can be used to understand climate change processes. Now the land surface, as I told you in the beginning, is also another part that we have included in the reanalysis system. And one aspect of the land surface, which is also coupled to climate, is the flux of carbon. The uh, global warming 
we believe, is most likely due to the increase of the content of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And we also know that the increase of carbon dioxide is due to human activities, ever-increasing use of oil and coal. However, when we look at the growth rate of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere from observations, it is not just an even growth of carbon dioxide concentrations. The growth rate in parts per million per year of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere fluctuates from year to year, as shown by this black curve here. If we look at the fluxes from the human-induced, the anthropogenic emissions of carbon dioxide, they do not fluctuate. They are fairly constant or slightly increasing in time. There is actually a slight dip in the emissions here in 2009. But as I see, the possible explanation is the economic crisis, 2008 to 2009. But then it picks up again. Carbon dioxide emissions have picked up. Let's hope that the global economy picks up in the same way. But from this figure here, you can certainly not explain the year-to-year -year variability of the rate of increase of carbon dioxide from a year-to-year -year variability of emissions from human-induced production of carbon dioxide. So the explanation must lie somewhere else. So what are the options? Well, carbon dioxide is, of course, absorbed by the oceans. So it could be variability in absorption of carbon dioxide in the same way as there is variability of heat absorption. And carbon dioxide is also absorbed by these land surfaces. Then in addition, carbon dioxide is affected by forest fires. You could potentially have a variability in forest fires, natural forest fires over the Earth, which could also be an explanation. But if you look at the ocean uptake and estimates of the emissions from the forest fires, it's actually quite constant. There is not much change from year to year. But if you just look at the difference between these two curves and what the residual is, it looks something like this. And if you compare that to the land sink that we get from the offline reanalysis, that is a land surface model, including a model of the carbon budget, and forced by the variability from year to year of circulation patterns, heat transfers, evaporation, and so on, you also get a year-to-year -year variability in carbon emissions, which actually resembles quite well the year-to-year -year emissions that we see of the growth rate of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So the land surface reanalysis, by coupling it to the Earth system, we have a potential explanation for this year-to-year -year variability of carbon dioxide increase rates in the atmosphere. It is likely due to the year-to-year -year variability of the uptake of carbon in the land surface system forests, vegetation at large, and so on. Of course, this is far from perfect. There are huge uncertainties in the carbon budget. And you also see a very clear offset between this residual and the offline reanalysis of the carbon. We still have a lot to learn about the carbon budget. But having an Earth system model, including all the components, will increase our ability to understand both the carbon cycle as a whole, which is so vital to make projections for the future of climate change, but also this year-to-year -year variability. And doing this type of analysis, we really have an independent assessment from carbon dioxide measurements of how well our model of transfer of heat and moisture and how well that functions in terms of year-to-year -year variability. And I think these results show that it actually is quite good also in that respect from independent measurements. So the future is in this coupled data assimilation development, both for our forecasting system and for the reanalysis. And the key challenge for a coupled system like this is to correct model drift at the interface between atmosphere, ocean, and land surface. And that is where we will put increased efforts in the future to improve our modeling in all these aspects. And this will give, as a byproduct, also a production of a consistent 20th century carbon flux reanalysis, in addition to the meteorological reanalysis. That's also one of the future goals of our reanalysis efforts. So, just to show you a timeline of the plans we have in reanalysis, showing you from 
2012, last year, up to 2017. The air interim is expected to be produced up until 2015. Then it will be taken over by a replacement of the air interim, which is called AIRASAT. We will do this first uh, e extended climate reanalysis for the 20th century. And then we will produce a weakly coupled and somewhere in the future for hopefully a fully coupled ocean atmosphere land reanalysis as part of our plans for the forward development. So to conclude, these three main areas of Earth system modeling, where we are active today and where we need to be active in the future to continue to improve both our weather forecasts and our analysis of the Earth system, is atmospheric composition, and it has an impact on NWP. It's marine monitoring and forecasting with a coupled ocean atmosphere model, which also is important for the medium and even the short range forecasts, as well as for the extended range forecasts. And then finally, reanalysis, both for the purpose of verification and calibration of our forecasts and for climate monitoring to be used by society at large. So I firmly believe that in order to further develop our prediction system, we have to include better and better, more and more components of the Earth system. We have to continue to work in this direction for ECMWF to continue to be successful in the future in medium range weather prediction. Thank you.